Hello there, my name is B, and you're listening to The Biologist of It, which is a podcast where we get the gist of what it is that biologists do. And last week was an interview of me by me, where I used a pop culture reference to explain the research that I do. And I will be doing these interviews with lots of biologists from many, many fields every other week. And in the weeks in between, I'll be doing minisodes like this, mini episodes, where I'll be introducing you to a posthumous biologist who did something really amazing with their career. And I've got a great list of people to introduce you to. I've had lots of really wonderful submissions from some of my listeners. Um, And this first one I actually discovered in a book by Zing Zheng called Forgotten Women, The Scientists. And in this book, I was introduced to many wonderful biologists And the one that I have picked out today is all things tree frog and women's rights. And I'm very excited to introduce you to her. And if the interviews and the minisodes sound like something you might enjoy, make sure that you follow and subscribe across YouTube, Spotify, wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. Give me a follow so you never miss an episode. So let's go into the story of Bertha Lutz. So Bertha was born on the 2nd of August 1894 in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Her mother, Amy Marie Gertrude Fowler, was a British nurse and her father, Adolfo Lutz, was a notable Swiss-Brazilian physician and epidemiologist and Adolfo is considered the father of tropical medicine and medical zoology in Brazil. So already coming from quite a biological background with her nursing mum and physician dad. And she would often follow her dad off on expeditions into the rainforest where she would collect specimens. And this is where Bertha first discovered her favourite animal and her research species, the tree frog. With this passion ignited, Bertha decided to study for a degree in natural sciences at Sorbonne, which is now the University of Paris. And she graduated in 1918. And around this time, she also became increasingly interested and aware of the growing suffrage movement of the suffragettes in the UK. Bertha felt a real affinity towards what they were trying to achieve, and she took this home with her to Brazil, where sadly, she would then read in a newspaper columnist declaration that feminist achievements in the UK and the US would have absolutely no effect in Brazil. Which, when you've just discovered women's suffrage, is really not the thing that you want to hear. But instead of being devastated by this and wallowing in self-pity, she did something really amazing and she put out a passionate call for Brazilian women to come together and prove that women should contribute to society across all aspects of life not just in the home, but also in politics and business and science. And when the argument that the woman's place is in the home was used against her, she would argue that the home is no longer just a space encompassed within four walls, which is absolutely girl boss energy. (laughs) I'm really sorry that I just used the term girl boss. In 1920, she was really amping up and founded the League for Intellectual Emancipation of Women with Maria Licarda de Maura, which was a movement to include women in all scientific areas. And Maria, the co-founder, was also a Brazilian feminist, but she was a teacher, journalist and writer as well. So two really great women looking to make sure that women have spaces in academic areas. And in 1922, She then went on to found the Brazilian Federation for the Advancement of Women. I'm going to try and say this in Portuguese. So apologies for the pronunciation if it's absolutely dreadful, but here we go. The Federatio Brasileira Pelo Progresso Feminino, which is otherwise... (laughs) Wow, that was really dreadful. Which was otherwise known as the FBPF. So just like with the British suffrage... The FBPF initially found success for the rights of the educated upper middle class members. So if you don't know, in the UK, women's suffrage first got the right to vote for educated upper middle class women. And it wasn't until much later 
that all women had the right to vote. And at this point, when the upper middle class women had the right to vote, working class men didn't start to have the right to vote still. So slow progress is what we're doing here, but progress nonetheless. And these upper educated, these upper middle class educated women were allowed to attend prestigious colleges, which meant that there was the potential for future female politicians within Brazil, which is really good news because if you can get women into positions of power, you can then pull other women up with you. Wonderful. So at this point, you're probably thinking, the where did the frogs go? <laughs> and I was wondering this too, but don't worry. Her love of frogs didn't stop there. And in fact, while she was building her foundation in 1922, she attended the first Pan-American Conference of Women in Maryland, US. And whilst out walking, she knelt down by a stream and pulled out a frog from the water, examined it excitedly and explained that it was the first time she'd ever seen a specimen like that. And then she spent the rest of the day collecting more frogs for her lab. And it just goes to show that once a biologist, always a biologist. You can be saving women's rights, creating women's rights, but if you see a good frog, you're gonna stop and pick it up. <laughs> her involvement in the fight for women's suffrage in Brazil made her a figurehead of women's rights across Brazil, all the way up until 1931. And it's not to say that this was because she was overshadowed by anyone, nobody took the role off her. It's that at this time, all Brazilian women were finally given the right to vote. And that made it the sixth country in the world to grant women the right to vote. So she'd done what she'd set out to do. And in 1931, suffrage had fulfilled its role, but not quite, because the story is never quite over. In 1933, she obtained a law degree, which is her second degree, from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And throughout her time, she then went on to introduce several proposals but most notably the focus of gender equality in the workplace. And you might have heard of one or two of these, including the right to earn equal pay and hold public office. So this was all relevant to Brazil, but these are the sorts of policies that she was helping to bring in and um, really pushing to bring in in Brazil. In 1935, she ran for a seat on the National Congress of Brazil and came in second behind Candido Pessoa. So she didn't win, but Candido unfortunately died one year later and so Bertha was able to take up the seat. This made her one of the few Brazilian congresswomen of her time. Of her time! Um, and while in congress she created the Statute of Women which was a committee dedicated to analysing every single Brazilian law and statute to ensure that none of them violated the rights of women. And although she got this committee started and going the project never saw fruit um, as her seat was taken over in the next election. So great intentions, the committee was set up, but unfortunately nothing happened there. But in spite of the fact that she'd lost her seat, she was still invited to the United Nations Conference on International Organization, um, which was held in San Francisco in 1945. And this conference was a pretty important one. It was the conference of 50 allied nations that oversaw the creation of the United Nations Charter. And of the 850 people who were present, Bertha was one of the four women who signed it. So many notaries, <laughs> four women. But one of them was Bertha, our girl boss, our 1920s girl boss. <laughs> In fact, when she was there, she noted that the word woman was not mentioned in the draft of the founding charter once, which meant that half the population of the world was effectively being ignored from the biggest peacekeeping charter in human rights history. <laughs> um, and so she fought for the inclusion of the word women, because at this point it just said equal rights for men. And she said, please can it say, equal rights for men and women. And surprisingly, one of the other female delegates present at the charter signing was not very happy about this and asked her not to ask for the term women to be included, since 
quote unquote, the woman said it would be a very vulgar thing to do. Very vulgar. This, when women butt heads over things like this, it always surprises me and doesn't surprise me at the same time because it does happen again and again throughout history. But to try to suppress other women when you are a woman in power is, it's, it's hard to stomach. Um, another of the delegates, another of the only female delegates present, and sadly the British representative, Ellen Wilkinson, told her that gender equality already existed because she'd been invited to the conference at all. So to Ellen and this other delegate, being invited was enough and we didn't need to make sure that women was in the charter. Without Bertha being a tenacious feminist of her time, especially during the UN Charter, and without her being at the United Nations at all, it likely would not have been mandate to protect women's rights for many years to come. Legally stating equal rights for men rather than for men and women would have meant all sorts of things could have been kept from women following on from this in all of those allied nations. So it's really important that she was there. It's really important that she stood her ground and said, I want the word women to be in there too. So thanks, Bertha. Throughout her latter years, Bertha served to continue expanding women's rights. And she served as the vice president of the Inter-American Commission of Women from 1953 to 1959. And in 1970, at the 15th annual meeting of the Inter-American Commission of Women, she proposed addressing specific problems faced by Indigenous women. So right up until the year before she died in 1975, she was present at the World Conference on Women in Mexico City. And both of these conferences were dedicated to expanding the rights of women around the world. And she... Bertha was dedicated to expanding women's rights around the world and she did not stop until she physically could not attend any more. And in 1976, at the age of 82, Bertha Lutz passed away. During her lifetime, Bertha contributed to numerous conferences on women's rights legislations, charters, you name it. She did it for upper middle class women, indigenous women, working class women, women from across America, across the world, she had a hand in it, from the home to the workplace to politics and science. She was committed to making sure that all women had a space in all places. And she was also an incredible biologist. She had her passion from the beginning and she published numerous scientific studies on frogs, including observations on the life history of the Brazilian frog, which she published in 1943, and my favourite book title uh, of recent, which is called A Notable Frog Chorus in Brazil in 1946. Bertha has four frogs named after her and two lizards, and she's a reminder that just because you've been invited doesn't mean that the work is done. The work stops when we all have equality. And it has been my great pleasure to introduce Bertha to you today. What an incredible woman. What an incredible way to start off this minisode. I cannot wait to show you who I've got lined up for the next one. I had a couple of people request him. So I will tell you all about him in the next one. In next week's episode, I'm back to interviewing and I have a very special guest who is a little bit of a social media sensation. Um, all the way from Texas. I think some of my Twitter followers might know who he is. And speaking of Twitter, things that I've spoken about today, I'll be including on Twitter and Instagram at Biologist of It. So you can have a little look at some of these frogs, publications, some of the work of Bertha, some places that I can recommend you look her up if you're interested to learn more. And if you're interested in me as a person, I don't know why you would be. But if you are, then I'm at Dr. B Nichols. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram. I can't wait to speak to you in the next one. I have been B, you have been wonderful, and this has been The Biologist of It. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.